What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Today we're gonna to talk about Professor John Frame's genius idea of triperspectivalism. Triperspectivalism, big word, don't worry, I'll define it as we go. Let me just take a moment to say what's up. Uh, my name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. Please come check us out. Well, John Frame was one of my professors, and I will confess at the beginning of this video that I am fond of his teaching. I think he's a, a wonderful, systematic theologian and philosopher. He is somewhat controversial in the PCA. Not everybody agrees with everything he's ever said. Um, he's done a marvelous work teaching over very many years, taught a number of students throughout the, uh, throughout the years, systematic theology and or philosophy and or apologetics. He is a presuppositional apologetics advocate. He studied under Cornelius Van Til and others, John Murray, etc. He has an amazing pedigree as far as his own learning goes. He has taught at uh, Westminster Seminary, California, and then recently retired from RTS Orlando again, my professor. So one of his main ideas, perhaps even a controversial idea, is something that he calls triperspectivalism. It's a way of seeing all of reality from three different perspectives. Now, I'm going to define this here with the terms that Frame uses in just a moment, but let me let me just ask you this. Why triperspectivalism? Try perspectivalism. Why three perspectives? Well, one of the things that we might say initially is that um, our God is a Trinitarian God. That is to say, there's one God who eternally exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Frame will tell you that his tri perspectivalism is not necessarily um, an exegetical method that's formulated on the Trinity because triperspectivalism is three different ways of seeing the same thing, whereas God, there's one God who really does eternally exist in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, there does seem to be some connection there to this idea of a, a Trinitarian world that God has made. If you think about it, it's kind of interesting. The world is comprised of the, the land, the sky, and the sea. Um, you might even think of time as being the past, the present, and the future, all three different perspectives on the same reality. We might think of color as comprised of red, yellow, and blue. That's kind of interesting. You might think of even music as being the key, the melody, and the harmony. And so when you start to look at reality, it's kind of interesting how many trifold or triperspectival distinctions you can see just in the world around us. I don't think that's an accident, and I don't think Frame thinks that's an accident either. Now, when he speaks of his three perspectives, John Frame is going to use three kind of technical terms, and I want to introduce them to you just so you understand what we're talking about. The first perspective Frame calls the normative perspective. It is the perspective of the norm or what ought to be. We might think of God's decrees. We might think of God's laws. We might think of God's commands here. It is the way that God intends to order the world that he has made. So it's the normative perspective or the perspective of what ought to be according to God's command and according to his will. The second perspective is called the situational perspective. It has to do with what is actually going on in the world around us. I'm sitting here on a Tuesday morning. I got my lights on, my cameras rolling. I got a mist and a fog out there in the beautiful western Pennsylvania hills. There's some traffic out there. Uh, about a mile or so away. That's the situation as it is um, being perceived by me right now here where I am. But then there's the third perspective, and that is the existential perspective, and that is what's actually happening inside of the observer. So I've got feelings and I've got emotions and concerns and worries and joys and elations, and all of that is stirring in with, within me. And so what, what Frame says that's really genius in my view, it's very simple but very genius, is that every single topic every single theological heading, every single creature, every single aspect of reality can be observed from these three perspectives. The normative, what ought to be the situational, what is actually occurring, and the existential, what is going on inside the observer, inside the heart or the mind of that person. So Frame will sometimes use these technical terms, normative, situational, and existential. Very often, though, he'll use a little bit more biblical language where he'll call it control, authority, and presence. 
And so you can kind of parse that out, and he does so in all of his writings. So if you've ever read anything by John Frame, whether it's this excellent little book here, Salvation Belongs to the Lord, which is his introduction to systematic theology, or his magnum opus, Systematic Theology, or any of his works on apologetics or philosophy, you will see over and over again these little triangles that Frame has in his books that illustrate these three principles over and over again, the normative, the situational, and the existential. Now, before I lose you on this, and I realize this is probably like, woof, right over your head, right? Hold on a sec, because it's easier to understand than the terms may suggest. Let's take, for example, a simple can of soup. Can you imagine with me what a simple can of soup might look like? Okay. Well, let's analyze this from the three perspectives. And then I'm gonna give some doctrinal examples too, but let's just take a can of soup just for the fun of it here. So what is a can of soup? How can we observe this object? How can we consider what this thing actually is in reality? Well, one thing we could do is we could look at the label and we could see what is supposed to be in this can of soup. So I hold up the can, there's all of these ingredients. I've got my tomatoes, I've got my tomato paste, my water, my salt, my spices, whatever else, I don't know, simple can of soup, right? Tomato soup. The normative situation is what ought to be in this can. You pick it up, it says tomato soup, there ought to be tomato soup in this can. If I open it up and I find a watermelon in there, that's a problem because the norming norm, what is expected to be in this can of soup, is exactly what is said in the ingredients. Now, if anything else creeps in there, then that's probably gonna be a problem. If there's cricket legs or bug parts or whatever, <laughs> whatever else, uh, that's a problem because the can of soup is normed to be what is said, stated on the label. Now, that's the normative. The situational, so I go to the grocery store and where am I gonna find it? I'm gonna find it on this particular shelf. I'm gonna reach up, I'm gonna reach over, I'm gonna find it in the row of other cans of soup that are like it. And so this can of soup can be found amidst other cans of soup in the food aisle, the dry goods aisle, at the store, on a Wednesday, for the price of $1.99, okay? And then there's the existential perspective, and that is what is actually inside the soup. If I were to cut open the top and I were to pour it into a bowl and analyze it, what's actually in there? Is it tasty? Is it salty? Uh, is it rancid? I don't know. That's the existential perspective. And so what Frame says is that you can take any object or even any topic and you can analyze it from those three particular perspectives. So we can start with God as the Trinity, the one God who eternally exists in three persons. Now this is an oversimplification of course, but you might think of the Father as the person of the Trinity who is in total control of all of the universe. He is the one who ordained it to be created. He is the one who has the power to make all things. He is the one who sets the rules of the universe into motion, how gravity is going to work, how the law of thermal, thermodynamics is going to work. And not only that, but he's the one who ordains to send his son into the world to redeem it. He is the one who ordains the whole plan of redemption history before any of it is ever fulfilled. And so we might think of the Father as the person of the Trinity who norms the norm. He is the one who establishes his righteous decree. The Son then would be the one who actually comes into the world. He is born. He is God incarnate. He is the one who lives a perfect life. He is walking around situationally in the uh, in in the city of Nazareth. He's born in Bethlehem. Now he's walking on the Sea of Galilee. He is the one who comes to the actual situation in a particular time in a particular place in history. And then obviously the Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who fills our hearts. He is the one who causes us to be regenerated. He is the one who gives us new life and gifts us with his gifts and graces us with the fruit of the Spirit, etc. And so we might think of the Trinity from these perspectives, the normative, the Father, the situational, the Son, and the existential being the Holy Spirit. But you can get even more specific than that, and that's what's interesting about this, what I think is a genius idea, is that you, this concept can be almost infinitely fractionalized. So I can simply take even one of those persons and then again analyze them with the three perspectives. So let's say I take Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity. Well, normatively, he is the exact image of the Father. He's the perfect image of the Father. And so he is um, who he is to be. He is the perfect representative of God's glory. I'm thinking about Hebrews chapter 1, the first paragraph. 
But secondly, though, Christ is the one who came into the world and completely obeyed all of the laws of God. So situationally, he is absolutely perfect in everything that he did, said, was, how he lived. And then existentially, we could think of Christ as being the one who is most perfectly and completely filled with the loving power of the Holy Spirit. Um, now, this is where John Frame's idea is totally genius. I, I wish that I had even one good idea in my entire life. The reality is I'm mostly just a repeater of the brilliant things that other people say. You know, if I can just be faithful to the scriptures and uh, hopefully a good teacher of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and I, I teach what Edwards and Sproul and, <laughs> and Calvin and other people before me thought of, I rarely have a good idea that is original. This is a very interesting idea that Frame brings to systematic theology, and the payoff is simply this. You can take any doctrine and you can analyze it with this tri-perspectival methodology. So let's just take baptism, okay? What is baptism? Let's say you're going to teach a message on baptism. You are called upon to give the Sunday School lesson, and the topic is baptism. Well, what do you say about it? Well, we can hold it up to the triperspectival analysis and we can say, well, baptism normatively is what? It's the placing of the Trinitarian name upon a person. We are to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So baptism comes with a particular meaning and that meaning is established by scripture and the normative perspective. But it's not just that. Because what does baptism do? It separates us from the world. And so this is the demarcating or the situational perspective Baptism separates us as the disciples of Christ, and therefore our lives, as we live them out in real life here, they're supposed to be different. Baptized people are supposed to be obedient in ways that the unbelievers certainly are not. Um, and then, what else? Existentially, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so, not only are we talking about water baptism, but that there's the real change, that inward filling of the power and the transformation of the holy life that is wrought about by God's Holy Spirit. So see what I did there? I just took baptism and I analyzed it by those three perspectives. I could preach that, man. That'd be an awesome three-point sermon on the topic of baptism. But I can do it on the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? Well, normatively, the Lord's Supper is that which it's signs signify. So we have bread and we have the cup, right? Well, those things have meaning. The meaning is established by the normative perspective. So when I'm looking at the meaning of the Lord's Supper, I might say that the bread is indicative of his body and that the cup is indicative of his blood. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, that supper is not just an empty bare symbol, but it actually it has a normative meaning to it that we are supposed to heed as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Situationally, though, we don't take the Lord's Supper by ourselves. How do we take the Lord's Supper, according to 1 Corinthians 11? With the church. And so it's not just me, but it has to do with all of my relationships within the body of Christ. This is something that we do communally. But then existentially, uh, the Lord's Supper must be taken with a heart attitude of repentance. And so even as I'm taking these outward symbols, which have meaning, the normative, with my fellow believers who are sitting around me, the situational, yet it better be true that in my heart, there is some, uh, some wonder-working graces as God is driving me to repentance and leading me to greater and greater faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Or I'll just give you one more example. Let's say we're talking about sin. What is sin? I'm going to teach a message on sin. Well, we can look at sin from all three perspectives. Sin is the violations of God's law. Well, duh, sin is doing what God said not to do, or conversely, doing what no, wait, <laughs> doing what God said not to do or not doing what God said to do, that's sin, right? The violation of God's law. Normatively, situationally, though, what happens in sin is that it breaks up my relationships with other people. It always damages me in terms of my relationships with my loved ones. Of course, it has a rendering, breaking, tearing relationship with me and God because sin does that. But then existentially in the heart, then sin is the deformation of my affections and my desires. So once again, I just think that would really, really preach. And so John's idea of, John Frame's idea of taking any doctrine and analyzing it by these three perspectives is, is really quite, quite astounding. So the payoff then is in its didactic value. Frame will tell you that. This is a, a teaching device. This is a mnemonic device. This is a didactic approach to teaching any particular doctrine. 
And I think about this when I'm preaching my sermons all the time. All the time I think about this. If you're ever looking for three applications to any one doctrine, just run it like this, normative, situational, and existential. So one more example and then I'll be done. So right now I'm preaching through the book of Revelation and we happen to be in that section of Revelation where Christ is giving his letters to the seven churches, right? All right, so what am I going to say about each one of those letters? Well, first, I can look at them as the, the normative perspective. Who is Christ and what does he command of each one of these churches? What does he require them to do? Situationally then, how are they carrying out the Christian faith in the world? Are they compromising with the idolaters? Are they influenced by the Nicolaitans? Are they subjecting themselves to the teachings of Jezebel, that false prophet? And then existentially, we might say, okay, well, whatever else they may be doing externally, but what's happening in the heart? Is there real repentance, real faith, real love, etc.? What is actually happening within the soul? That is, after all, what matters the most. Okay, so Frame, I think, has this genius idea of triperspectivalism. He applies it to practically everything, and uh, so can you, so there's huge payoff in that. Now, before we go, and we've already gone about 16 minutes, let me just simply give a couple of book recommendations. First of all, this one right here, Salvation Belongs to the Lord, an Introduction to Systematic Theology. If you've never read anything by John Frame, this would be a good place to start. It's one of the most helpful books that I have, and I consult it all the time. It's only a couple hundred pages, though, though it does go through most of the major doctrines of the Christian faith. If you want more than that, then go to his bigger book, Systematic Theology. It takes the same concepts, expands them to a couple thousand pages, if I'm not mistaken. Much bigger book, much fuller detail. Um, he also has an amazing book on the history of Western philosophy. That book has been helpful. He's got a tiny little book, in an introduction to philosophy, and a bunch of other stuff on apologetics besides. All right, so there's your introduction to Frame's triperspectivalism. By the way, my book drops today, Souls, How Jesus Saves Sinners. It's not about triperspectivalism, but it is about the gospel, and I would love for you to check that book out. Of course, I'll have a link to it in the description of this video. Thank you so much for checking in. I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.